Uh, Goran Branešević is uh, assistant professor and research fellow at the Department of Philosophy, University of Ljubljana. His main areas of research include German idealism, political philosophy, linguistics, structuralism, and psychoanalysis. Um, he's also a translator. He is one of the translators of Hegel's Encyclopedia in Slovenian. And he's currently co-editing an edited volume on the idea of the good, which is to appear by the end of the year, approximately. Uh, idea of the good in Kant and Hegel. And he's also preparing a monograph on the concept of speculation. Uh, and the title of his talk today is um, the, the Triumph of Money. Can I? Yes, oh, sorry. The triumph, the triumph of, money, of and money and its discontents, Marx alienation and exchange. Okay, uh, yeah, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martin. Okay, in the talk, I will try to answer the question, a simple question if the essence of money is inherently tied to alienation. As is well known, according to Marx, money has a specific value, but not really in the sense of a value that can be monetized according to market logic. Money has a more, let's say, foundational status, acting as an equivalent of the Hegelian movement of speculative logic, which is, in Marx's words, and I'm quoting him, the money of the spirit, das Geld des Geistes. And I'll come back to it at the end of my talk. Uh, just as thought can be abstracted from reality to the point of constituting just an abstraction and thus merely Another form of alienation, money, as an ideal form, constitutes the most abstract and therefore the most complete form of alienation through private property. And just as divine gaze once provided the legislatures and leaders with their power, nowadays this is provided to them through property, or it's in its refined form, money. This market phenomenon in its pure form is underlying social antagonism of the capitalist system, which also harbors within itself specific adjuvant functions such as exchange, fetishism, estrangement, desire, value, and so on and so on. And in my talk, I will also focus on these fundamental mechanisms with, without which we cannot grasp the truth of money because it does not signify anything in particular. Money is simply money. Its true essence seems to be detached from both sensuality and abstraction, but that is precisely, precisely its, let's say, real value. When discussing this topic, it is important to bear in mind uh, that there are certain blind spots in uh, Marx's worldview, since he is haunted by the specter of immediate contact with authentic reality, which introduces a certain amount of confusion into his analysis. We will therefore look at the logic of alienation through some theoretical twists and turns. And I think that the premise that alienation is more or less an unavoidable predicament of men, I hope, I really hope, doesn't need further elaboration on my part, as in these past few days, a number of uh, different, very well-funded uh, perspectives have been put forward on this topic. But let us not forget that historically, it was already Rousseau who sowed the seeds of the modern understanding of alienated being of humanity, since for him, the basic premise of sociality was that the social man lives constantly outside himself. But although, according to Rousseau, the alienation from originally good life is opposed on him by impermanence of nature and the benefit of socialization, he also stresses that private property, and man striving for recognition, which has become the focus of many contemporary thinkers' thoughts, is in fact his own work. Therefore, all attempts to return to, let's say, idyllic, mythical state of freedom and equality are destined to fail tragically, as this lost object of desire is only present through the politics of uh, autonomous subjects who cede their rights to the community by way of, quoting Rousseau, complete alienation. The civilizing of man therefore takes place as his decadence into external appearance of himself. The spirit of this constitutive, we can say comical subjective trait, is later summed up by Kant when in anthropology he declares people are by, lar by and large are more civilized the more they are actors. 
Yet, as already mentioned in passing, in resource unfolding uh, of the figures of social men, we also find a specific criterion for understanding the modern, modern man in the form of wealth. Wealth is, is not a natural prerequisite, a prerequisite of men, as they are found only in the form of physical traits like age, health, bodily vitality, and so on and so on. However, Rousseau's uh, predilection towards a prosperous society required wealth, but in a mediocratic form. So everybody lives and nobody is really wealthy, like this utilitarian requirement. This core value depended on the cultivation of labor that spurred the emergence of the right of property and with it, an economic base. And this, quoting Rousseau, private property was the most sacred of all rights. And it also prompted, in parallel, the formation of an organized device in the form of money, for which Rousseau himself had profound distrust. And the primary reason for that was due to money being, for him, unnatural, arbitrary, extrinsic, but most damning for him for having no inherent value of an object as it, is only, as it only represents things by way of science. So representing something else and not an absolute value of a specific property, it serves as no more than a sign, and a sign of inequality, as it is predicated on excess. And Rousseau wanted to replace all these alienating elements, rather, I can say naively, with uh, things of absolute necessity that are visible and have immediate recognizable value, which importantly also wouldn't exaggerate ordinary needs and desires, of course. But while Rousseau's relationship to alienation was unambiguous, seeing it as the path of man's downfall, his striving for the freedom of all and overcoming of inequalities also brought him to the precipice of the modern concept of alienation. And while later thinkers did not fully embrace this, we can say, fruitful motives, they did take up other significant aspects of his thought uh, on alienation. Even practically the whole German classical philosophy, uh, which of course had uh, a profound influence on Marx's perception of social reality, inherited and identified with this category in one form or another. And we can briefly go through a couple of examples uh, within German classical philosophy. Uh, started with Kant, it is the estrangement phenomenon of society, such as uh, ambition, desire, mastery, uh, desire for mastery, honor, uh, need and even, of course, war, famously, which impels humanity towards peace and justice. But more pertinent to the emergence of modernity, alienation becomes irrevocably bound up with freedom, a topic which, of course, invigorated the intellectual debates of the time. And out of Kant's subject, which prescribes laws to, the nat uh, to nature, emerges fictus nature-creating creator I, whose own product appears uh, alien and resistant. If we leave aside some other depictions of alienation, then of course we quickly come to Hegel. And in Hegel, uh, we find perhaps the most fundamental formula of alienation ex and externalization into freedom, uh, founded as building activity, so cultivation and formation, building, and on the basis of which the subject is actualized into a free, rational being. This process of alienation should be understood as a movement towards the universal, which is accomplished by breaking with natural dispositions. And while we have asserted that alienation is an unavoidable uh, predicament of man, we cannot conversely say that about the manner of an alienation, their consequences for the social fabric and the impossible possible need for remedies. These are all still some open issues. And the next step of reasoning seems then to lead uh, seamlessly to Marx. However, if we were to assume that Marx, uh, assume that with Marx we had finally set, set foot on familiar ground of alienation, we would be somehow mistaken. By the contrary, Marx didn't use the concept of alienation in a uniform manner. And uh, all of his different positions, there are at least four, vis-a-vis -vis alienation, they are neither bound to the same cause nor, are the, the, uh, nor have they the same systemic uh, relevance. But if we were to start at the beginning with Marx, at the very beginning of Marx's trajectory of thought, then we famously find in his doctoral thesis 
the difference between the Democritian and the Epicurean philosophy of nature from 1841, uh, we find the Epicurean atomism, Marx says that, as an alienated form of thought, which in hindsight might even have been a stamp of approval. And he justifies this curious hypothesis by emphasizing that in the Epicurean universe, appearance as appearance can subsist as a distinct essence, but as such, it must be in its reality considered as alienated. Quoting Marx. Hence, Marx's unusual closeness to Epicurus is for him, again quoting Marx, the concept of the atom in the world of being is an abstraction, annihilation, and a return of all determinate, determinate existence into being for itself. Although Marx consistently criticized capitalism's ability for abstraction to self-mystify its own image as a necessary condition of its own existence, his early Epicurean inspired worldview, therefore, began precisely with a praise for the abstract dimension of social reality, where the self-determining nature of thought and reality becomes apparent. And Marx's fundamental gesture was thus to equate Epicurus's philosophy with Hegel's logical explications. In his logic, Hegel's entire enterprise is to envision uh, and explain thought as a self-determining totality, and Hegel explicitly praises in that uh, praises the forms of ancient atomism for the invocation of the negativity of thought, so the mother of self-determination. Despite Marx's closeness to Hegel, to Hegel's speculative philosophical, philosophical system at the time, he very soon distanced himself from his thought on the grounds that he recognizes a mystical dimension in his speculations. The turn towards uh, Marx's critique of mystification can be found, for example, in his uh, book, Holy Family, Heilige Familie. And it's justified by Marx with the same argument that Hegel, at the very beginning of his logic, accuses modern pedagogues of who would, according to Hegel, of course, happily embrace a people without metaphysics. This break from speculative thinking was motivated by the belief that reason disentangles oneself from the hold of experience, which would, quoting, by itself beget nothing more but, than, uh, but mental fancies. In Holy Family, Marx shows the inner logic of uh, this mechanism of mystification, which equates uh, with speculative construct, which he uh, equates with speculative construction. So basically, the mystifying and alienating effects brought about by speculation are based on forming a general representation out of individual factual things. And Marx offers a really, really simple example. He says that apples, pears, strawberries, and almonds become abstract representation of fruit. Or to put it in another way, they become mere modes of the fruit's existence. What is real and essential about the apple, the pear, and so on and so on is not actual, sensuous, uh, sensuous characteristics, but for our part, these characteristics are, quoting Marx, abstracted from them and an essence imposed on them, the essence of our idea of them. So speculation basically makes from the various real fruits a fruit of abstraction, the concept of fruit. But in a sense, we can also say that it is only in this form of universality that makes the specific real fruits possible for us to consume. And unsurprisingly, following Marx, it is necessary, of course, to return the alienated essence back to the alienated thing from such constructed notion. However, since things are, this is the catch, since the things are a reflection of abstraction, one cannot simply discard any trace of the initial abstraction, since the thing's actuality is now provided in the form of an appearance of shine. And this formal process of mystification has significant implications for the labor process, because the, the products of human labor, by thinking on the appearance of independent entities, become independent not only going forward, but also more fundamentally in retrospect. And this principle of creation, this chaufferische Prinzip, which Marx recognized in Hegel, has for him a sort of a religious character, as the dialectical method operates in such a way that thinking takes the form of an autonomous subject, or as Marx puts it, demiurge of reality, which only forms its external appearance. 
And according to this logic, the representative world is alienated from itself, since the conditions for the possibility of, ex of its existence are, again, quoting Marx, as a self-consciousness that has come out of itself, that contradicts itself, that has come estranged and alienated. The self-consciousness that has come to itself, that understands itself, that grasps its essence, is therefore the power over beings of its self-expression. And following Marx further, and most significantly for the purpose at hand, the same creative principle is at work as the driving force for the economic structure. So that we have like property, capital, wage labor, and as well, we shall see, especially money, are therefore not the aforementioned mental fancies, but rather, again, quoting far, uh, Marx, very practical, very objective products of their self-alienation, which must therefore also be sublated in a practical, objective way, not only in thought, in consciousness, because man becomes man in mass being, in life. And accordingly, there seems to be a gap, or more precisely, an antagonism between life and consciousness present in capitalist society, but also between universality of the capitalist economic structure and a specific particularity of this structure. And uh, the four mentioned alienated elements, capital, money, and so on, are thus intimately intertwined with thinking, with self-consciousness, and being. And it is therefore not insignificant that Marx should have placed them at the center of the economic conceptual apparatus. And as a result, his political economy cannot be regarded simply as a discipline for calculating the appropriate relation between ends and scarce means, but also a method for critically analyzing the fundamental antagonism between com commodities and their value, which encapsulates a certain non-relation that holds reality together. So the usual, let's say, common sense manner in which we understand economic logic, which is practically evident in uh, the way value is conceived, is to a great extent bound up with uh, what we may call utility-based interpretation of the marginalists. Just in a nutshell, the theory of the marginalists is linked to the question regarding the difference uh, in value between two commodities, let's say a Rolex watch and a Casio watch. And the reason, supposed to re the reason uh, for the difference is supposed to reside in the added satisfaction provided by the one of the watches, let's say the Rolex, which, and this is the marginal utility of one. However, such reasoning relies on an erroneous deduction, and equally makes guided is the twin of value through labor. The, I think this is more important, which is most commonly associated with Marx's theory according to which the magnitude of labor spent in production gives us the comparable degree of value. And production of individual producers would therefore directly provide value, with money being, of course, only secondary, of a secondary importance. And critics are most often content with this labor-focused image of alienation and associated, of course, exploitation, since the struggle against it can be formul formulated quite straightforwardly. You have, like, labor, and you know what to do with it. And there are, of course, famous, really famous examples how to bypass or... Um, how to bypass alienation of social relations through the use of immediate labor time used instead of value labor product. Uh, practically all former socialist states fall under such category in an attempt to create an environment where social relations wouldn't be any more obscured by fetishism and objectification of these relations. Alienated relations would be replaced by a sort of a technical organizational form of production premised on a structure of, and this is really important, of conscious regulation of labor time. However, such efforts are themselves the main source of criticism of labor-oriented value theories. If you consider conditions in the Soviet Union or GDR, um, a simple reduction of, to labor time appeared to be an insufficient interpretive and analytical method. Intense manual labor, simple labor, and intellectual labor, complex labor, have shown themselves to be impossible to compare without an addition of price. And even if we would assume that the, uh, the, that the substance of value is not measurable, quanti uh, measure, uh, measurable quantity of labor time, but it is rather a social relation that gets manifested only in the prices attached, there is an inherent problem to such argumentation. In addition to the considerations regarding comparison, the conscious determination of price becomes problematic as there is no condition under which price and value could be tied except in price itself. 
And one way, one way of circumventing the problem of value specification was to measure the labor content input of the products by way of a certain quantity of gold. But this reflection also made a mistake to understand labor in a physical sense and not through its abstract socioeconomic character. The idea was, of course, that with traditional Marxism, that the substance of value has been understood in a, let's say, quasi-physical uh, or substantialist manner. The worker has expanded a specific quantity of abstract labor, and this quantity exists within the individual community. And there was, of course, not just hope, but promise of a naturalization and defetization of the economy present uh, in the Soviet Union. And one of the bedrocks of the socialist planned economy was this supposed uh, re really known law of value, which states that the price of commodities are regulated by the socially necessary quantities of direct and indirect labor required to produce them. But how does this, uh, how does then socially necessary labor time acquire value if it is impossible to define this non observable substance or measure of this value remains, of course, unanswered. And even though commodity economy in the form of the markets and socialist production seem antithetical, there is a link present between them in the form of money or exchange. And instead of categories of labor time or power, Marx observed that the real, not sole, real value constituting uh, principle is namely money. Value following Marx as a social and not, not a natural property of commodities can only appear in the relationship between two commodities. A unit of concrete labor of one worker is not abstractly equal to the same unit of concrete labor of another worker by itself. There must be some exchange present to accomplish that. And value is therefore not just a social relation, as it is further defined by market exchange that takes place between equal amounts of objectified labor. And just to reiterate, we have come now to the position where money is the um, only possible measuring stick for value, whereas value itself is a social relation. Following, let's say, common sense reasoning, money would be seen only as a part of the development of reducing transaction cost. However, as I already mentioned, a more fundamental process is taking place during the production cycle. The products of concrete labor become alienated, self-sustaining, and estranged into seemingly autonomous things. And, this, and in this respect, it should be borne in mind that according to Marx, there is, quoting him, a twofold nature of labor represented in commodities represented in commodities. There is a particular concrete labor that produces quali uh, qualitatively different use values. So let's say carpentry produces a chair. However, carpentry does not produce value as uh, carpentry. Ra rather, it produces value as human labor, whose product is exchanged with other products of human labor. Or simply said, labor of carpentry produces chairs while value itself is established through exchange. As, uh, if I quote Heinrich, labor abstracted from its concrete manifestation of carpentry. It is essential to keep this in mind that this abstraction is present in everyday actions uh, of people, which they are generally, generally unaware of. Although we have highlighted Marx's rather critical view of Hegel's philosophy. It is in his critical treatment uh, of the system of abstractions in their totality that Marx comes closest to Hegel. For the emphasis in abstraction is not in the results, uh, result of abstraction, but on the abstraction as a process, process of alienated objectification. But since Hegel's philosophy represents the culmination of self-alienation in thought, Marx equates his logic with the alienated structure of capitalism. And it is in this respect that we have, been, uh, we have to be interested in the structure of money as the fundamental contemporary alienating form, which is nothing other than the fundamental alienating principle of a capitalist society. The products of labor by themselves, therefore, have practically no value, which is only activated by the realization of surplus labor, where labor no longer presents the accumulation of, of the producer's labor, but an exchange value bound to money. And this creates a two-tier, a kind of two-tier self-sufficient mechanism for surplus value creation. Firstly, it is 
thus possible to integrate labor into the production of surplus value by means of money, which also ensures the reproduction of the capitalist structure. And secondly, in retrospect, money now encapsulates the conditions of possibility of existence of social relations as a process of, we can say, the disymmetrical exchange along the lines, not anymore commodity, money, commodity, but uh, money, commodity, money, MCM. So money actualizes a specific trait of the world, its movement, its movements, a world of actions, effects, and habits. And it is precisely in this movement, from nothing to everything, that the crea creative, religiously inspired principle comes to the fore by fashioning its own external appearance. There is also a third notion in the process of value creation through exchange and money, which have, we have already mentioned in passing. It is fetishism. It is in the other, we can say, on other side of the alienated structure. As is well known, the idea of fetishism is introduced by Marx in the first chapter of Capital. But there is, a, let's say, a mystical note attached to it. Commodities may look like trivial things, of course, but they are, quoting Marx, full of metaphysical subtlety and theological quirks. And the mysterious fetishism of the commodity form is simply present in the way that it reflects back to people the social characters of their own labor as the objective characters of the labor products themselves. Fetishism is therefore a practice, a practice how producers relate to each other. They relate, of course, not directly, but mediated through their products. The, nef the definitive social relation between men themselves assumes here for them the fantastic, quoting Marx, the fantastic form of a relation between things. So it's a fantastic form. And just a quick, just one reference to Lacan, which is, I think, very pertinent here. Uh, money for Lacan is the fetish par excellence. Money in a sense that it hides the foundation of its value, quoting uh, Lacan from Seminar 16. So what is possible within this highly speculative capitalist logic of alienation? Well, we saw that Marx was critical of Hegel's uh, contribution to the emergence of modern capitalist society. He also identified a certain lifeline in his thought. Hegel logic is, so the Marx thesis uh, should, should be read, founded on the principle of alienation, which also turns out to be the main crutch, of course, of his philosophy. However, by depicting the human structure, it also, it also has significant potential for a critical conceptualization of the modern human essence. This education of alienated social, social historical condition of human development reveals in Hegel's philosophy in his categories the abstractions of his alienation that have become independent, taken on a life of their own. Hence, Marx's very apt definition of Hegel's logic in Economische Philosophische Manuscripte, where he says, uh, logic, the money of the spirit. And he goes on to define uh, some uh, additions to define what he means with that. The speculative, quoting Hegel, uh, Marx, sorry, uh, the speculative thought value, the divested abstract thinking, the abstract thinking. So the principal problem Marx is in this is that Hegel presents alienation without reference to real alienation only as an ideal thought form. And in this form, it is only an abstract image of an alienated man, quoting uh, Marx. Meanwhile, Marx himself, on the contrary, says that, uh, quoting Marx again, the ideal is nothing other than the material transposed and translated in the human head. But we will not go into the implications and details of this term at this time, so I would just like to thank you for your attention.
still not working. Okay. Oh, okay. Now it's alive. <laughs> we live. Uh, okay. Thanks for the wonderful lecture, of course. Um, yeah, I think I will unfortunately have to uh, play the unfortunate role uh, like a fought police, basically. Uh, I'm just kidding, of course. Uh, but, I mean, I was listening to your lecture. I was looking forward to it because, of course, like I deal with Marxism and, you know, judging from the title. Uh, I was uh, uh, basically looking forward to it. Uh, my first question is uh, Zon Retel, so the guy who you know spoke about the real abstraction and basically uh, holds a key place. I mean, um, I suppose there's a reason why you didn't mention him. So this basically, like uh, my first question, and also like uh, one small correction. So Marx actually never like talked about labor being the only input, right? So there is also nature, you know, like, you know, like uh, in the critique of the Gotha program. And I mean, like, of course, uh, the entire capital starts with, you know, labor transforming nature. And I mean, in any, in any realistic calculations, like in ecological economics, this is like, calculated as an input. And, you know, you have the concept of natural capital, which we can debate whether it's good or not to use it. But anyways, it even like enters into some calculations, ex like externalities and stuff like that. So like uh, even on a practical level, it's, it needs to be there. So, and of course it's never only labor and nature, it's also technology. I mean, like uh, any sort of calculations for like, I don't know, gross domestic income and like gross national product is bound to, you know, like uh, use technologies and, you know, to calculate labor productivity. It's not, uh, you know, the same if you have a laborer who will work on, a, I don't know, like a treadmill mm -hmm. or like on a, you know, like a conveyor belt. So the productivity is uh, different if you use different technologies. The output is measured like uh, in terms of like monetary units differently because obviously gross add, like, you know, you have like something called the added value, which is of course like determined not only by labor. So, you know, I think focusing on labor alone is something that philosophers usually do because like uh, this heritage of Marx. But I think, you know, if you look at Marx himself, he kind of didn't like say that. So that's like one small uh, correction. And basically like, um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll basically st stop there, you know, like, uh, and we can make maybe debate it later, that's it. Okay, can I challenge your correction? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, firstly and foremostly, can you hear me? First and foremostly, uh, I never think I said that production is the only thing that produces the input. The input. Yeah. I said that it's uh, input for value producing. So. That's, I think, the correction. Maybe it makes a little bit more sense. But the other thing is that, of course, you have concrete labor, which is the labor that you were talking about, which is tied, of course, to nature, technology, and so on. But Marx, like specifically, he was really adamant on that. Uh, even if you look at the, the different versions of capital, uh, he was really interested in abstract value, uh, abstract labor, sorry. The abstract labor is the thing that makes uh, value possible. You have concrete like labor, it doesn't, in a sense, it doesn't matter in a sense. It's only like this uh, socially infused uh, labor, which means labor, it is a little bit, okay, a simplification, but labor which is mediated through the, through the society, which it made like, which has, which has then a, a, a sort of a me, mediating role and becomes a labor which is not labor anymore tied to what it was at the beginning, a physical uh, characteristic, but becomes something else. And I think that's the thing that uh, Marx is always trying to establish what is happening. Even if you go uh, look at the structure of capital, how it is written, we can go, okay, at the beginning, at the early Marx, he had a, a little bit different uh, ideas. But uh, capital itself, it's more, I would say, a philosophical project. I know that you will, you will be critical of that. But philosophical in a sense that he puts forth different categories and wants to see what happens with these categories. Like, just see what logically happens with the categories. And there are, like, specific categories which makes not just sense, but are uh, specifically categories which are always used when, like, establishing a value, establishing any other specific economical thing. And in that sense, I think that he was really inspired by the logic. And that's why he's always, if you look at uh, Marx, even in his late, like, I think it's 69 or something. No, it's even 70. He was saying in some one letter, I'm just waiting to finish something, one, le no, one like manuscript, and I'm, I'm going back to the logic because I, I think I have an idea, a good idea. 
So I think he was always like in his mind's logic, uh, Hegel's logic was always present. That's why I think that even capital itself uh, is based on a sense on logic. But he was, of course, that was a, I was trying, one thing that I was trying to do is show that he was trying to be critical of logic, how it is structured, that it is, that it is just based on thought, um, explication or uh, explication of uh, concepts, but he was trying, like I said at the, at the end, he was trying to embed it more in, we can say, reality or something like that. Zonretel. Ah, Zonretel. Uh, I think it's just uh, because there are a lot of uh, economical thinkers that I would use uh, if I would write a book, definitely. And he would be one of the main protagonists, definitely. Well, yeah. Um, by the way, sorry. I, I sorry. Like I remembered, like the question I wanted to ask. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, like, no, no. Okay, yeah, then take, yeah, me, yeah. take back my answer. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's like uh, uh, it's actually productive. I mean, I was uh, also uh, thinking about when you said that uh, in the socialist economies, mm -hmm. they, you know, the, they realize they cannot do basically economy in any other way expects from like expressing it in a price and you know thereby mm -hmm. I don't know what was like the consequence of what you said but basically I mean um, I was thinking like what were they supposed to do you know like leap into communism in 24 hours of course not yeah so mm -hmm. and I That's think like um, a lot of people forget how this economic playing actually looked like mm -hmm. I mean you needed like input output tables like uh, mm -hmm. you need to do material balances I mean I think also this material side if you want to like actually do a transition away from the shitty system that we're in now has to take place and that's by basically um, you know you can deconstruct some sort of uh, aspects of your economy for example Yugoslavia never had a, uh, how to say like a stock exchange you know mm -hmm. and it lasted for 50 years so you know, one of the consequences of this is like that the Belgrade stock exchange is like now shitty that you know it's like nowhere it's not important you know that's a direct consequence of this and I mean um, it, if you want to look at it, I think, you know, if you would like punch me to the wall or something like that, I would define socialism as basically like a controlled deconstruction of capitalism, you know, as opposed to like a collapse or something like that. So like, I think that this, the price system, you know, okay, I don't think we need to debate it now, <laughs> you know, like we're not going to reach a conclusion, but like, uh, I think, you, you know, you just uh, cannot go, you know, full scale solving all yeah. the social issues yeah. in 24 hours, yeah. especially that was like, uh, you know, you had the war, war communism, like being also complicate, further complicating factor, you know. So, I mean, I'm just going to end it there, basically. And um, I think that, um, you know, uh, yeah, okay, anyways, too, too much stuff, okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just one thing, uh, no, that was a really good, good uh, point, uh, how to leap into commun communism, because uh, until 54, I think, maybe 52, I have to check. Uh, speculation was um, outlawed in Soviet Union. So you cannot speculate on anything. You cannot like take money and speculate with money. There is like, I can't remember, there is a famous uh, trial which took place in the 60s in the Soviet Union where they specifically the trial was because of they were speculating with money, with genes, with I don't know, uh, a lot of things. So they did take into consideration what was happening, but uh, of course, how to make this uh, leap from, of course, maybe even, um, in a sense, human nature to speculate uh, into communist nature where speculation was not supposed to like be present. There is a, a point there. And I think that's one of, one, one of the problems in uh, the communist thought is that they didn't take into account this uh, logic that something is happening. That's why I, I did specifically say that they were trying to do these things consciously. And that's why I do agree with you. You need calculus, you need to go over all the calculations, what is happening within the common, let's say, socialist uh, country. But the problem is what happens like, with the things that you don't know, do not know that you are doing, in a sense. Um, thank you, Goran, for this really interesting talk. I especially like the part and um, on um, um, the parallel between describing alienation as the form of a process and um, 
the process of self-determination of thought or negativity in Hegel's science of logic. So uh, my question, comment goes in, in this direction. Um, so um, you said alienation is to be understood as a form of the process, and this process can be similar um, to that of negativity mm -hmm. of thought. Now, when we say that something is alienated, it is alienated from something else. So there is always a relation of separation. And we, when we talk about negativity of thinking, um, within Hegel's realm at least, uh, we do talk about the relation of separation and in this sense alienation. But um, negativity is always already also um, the process of return. So uh, a thought, a concept separates itself from something other, but yet at the same time uh, it returns to itself. So it kind of functions as a ground that is not alienated to itself in some sense. Uh, so um, there is, however, a point where this returning of thought to itself, this self-referentiality, um, stops in Hegel, and it's the point of nature. <laughs> so nature is the rupture of thought in Hegel, and this is, this is the point that precisely Marx um, said that Hegel uh, miss, um, missed. So um, I, I, I'm interesting to know your thoughts about this. Uh, and I mean, uh, it's not about that Hegel says after logic, let's open ourselves to nature, um, but let's start thinking nature without subsuming it to a concept. So yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this. Uh really brilliant question. Um, I know that you are doing uh, a lot of things with uh, like this precipice of nature with the concept of Entlassen. And I think that's one of the ways that I can answer it back to you, but that would be like your answer to your own question. I would just maybe, maybe rather uh, make a distinction here. I don't know. I was trying to, to see if someone did mention it, but in Marx there is like a specific distinction between Alienation and uh, estrangement. And usually we say like alienation, we, seem that, we say that uh, enfrandum is alienation, but you, like, if you look at the translation, it is not. It is estrangement is enfrandum. Mm -hmm. Alienation is uh, entoiserung. So this is, I think, one of, one of the specific things that needs to be taken into account when thinking about even this uh, logical process that happens with alienation, that something goes out of itself but it also becomes like alienated from something that, is, but that was never there to go out from. Um, the difficult question regarding nature, I think that's one of the core questions that uh, Marx was trying like, to, that's why I agree with uh, Alexander that that is uh, a point to be made, uh, that nature is uh, something that needs to be regarded as a form where it, it isn't just possible to go to the end with, uh, that's why Marx was also criticizing all the time Hegel. Because Hegel, he didn't read like, uh, I, th I don't think I never saw that he read uh, Encyclopedia, Marx. But I think that uh, that's why he was constantly criticizing Hegel, that he never takes into account this, like the real thing that is behind all this conceptual apparatus and so on and so on. So thank you again for, for the question. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Uh, I, I guess I was, I wanted to go back to the way that, I, I'm not sure I entirely understood the way um, that you were treating the relationship between value and price in Marx's theory as it bears on money. Uh, um, and I guess I just wanted to ask about, uh, well, you gave the example of the, the Rolex and the Casio, but, that, but uh, it seems to me important that that can't be explained yeah. you know, by socially necessary labor time, right? So that in Marx, when he says in volume three that he's treating like the, the, the average of the capitalist system, I mean, we can think about the difference in the prices between commodity lines mm -hmm. in terms of, that is let's, like the difference between the price of, of, of cars and pens. Mm -hmm. So on average, cars are much more expensive than pens, but of course there are pens which are more expensive than mm -hmm. cars. And that can't be explained on the basis yeah of socially necessary labor time, those are luxury prices that obey all these market mechanisms that actually are 
that, that uh, liberal economic theory can help to explain, right? There are effects of supply and demand, there are effects of marginal utility, et cetera. It's just that Marx is showing that those cannot explain the profit mechanism because firms are competing over surplus, you know, surplus labor time to generate surplus value. So, the, so, so I, I just wanted to get clear on it because I think it poses all kinds of problems if we try to, like the transformation problem causes all kinds of problems if we try to pin down a direct relationship between value and price in a way which doesn't take into account this averaging mechanism because you can't do it with yeah. luxury goods. There are all kinds of ways that that simply doesn't work. So to step back from that and think about it more broadly in terms of commodity lines. So value is much more abstract in that sense. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just wanted to ask you about no, no, how you think about I that. Yeah. Agree. I think there was a misunderstanding because okay. we're talking the marginalist would take that line that price is price is the point where you can make like a decision that price is the, uh -huh. it has some objective validity. I would say that Marx never would say that. Right. Marx would say, like you said, that uh, social necessary labor time is not enough. You have exchange, you have money, you have a lot of things that are happening, uh, circulation, and so on and so on. So you have. It's really too, I would completely agree with you that it's uh, even more abstract than you would think. That Marx is yes. really going to the, to the most radical point that is possible. Mm -hmm. And even at that most radical point, he would say that, um, that maybe that is not enough. That's why he was trying to, of course, the unwritten cap, uh, capital four and so on. He was still trying to see what's behind it. But it's just that, so just final comment. I mean, but there is a determinate relation. Right, so sometimes you'll get. It's not like you can explain value on the basis of money or something. <laughs> you know, no, no, so there a, is a determinant. Yeah. Yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah. but it's a floating. Of course. So one has to sort of pin down determinate regions of value without attaching them too directly to. So anyway, yeah, okay. Um, just a sub question: um, Is your position that there is something that is like yeah. substantially behind it or not? Yeah, that of course. The argument is that average socially necessary labor time in an average way determines the differentiation of value between, let's say, commodity lines, cars and pens. It's just that that's a massive average. You take all the cars, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it I can't explain the difference in the price between like, uh, you know, Volkswagens and Toyotas, not directly, of course, of course. right? So, but, but it's not as though it floats free of socially necessary labor time, of course. Yeah. I think, okay, this is maybe my reading, I think that Marx wouldn't agree with you that it's not just social, if you take socially necessary labor time, it's not labor time, just concrete labor time. But even the average labor time, if you take it as Marx puts it, uh, has in it uh, embedded uh, circulation, money, and so on. So we have a, a really big problem. It, it's not like that something happens that is at the beginning has like some substance, and then it becomes embroiled in this like exchange and so on. I think it's the other way around. You have like a problem where things are just happening in exchange, and then suddenly they just like stop in a sense. No, I don't. I wouldn't. <laughs> okay. No, no. Of course, of course. And it is it is a specific thing that Marx was struggling with. That's why if you look, even if you look at uh, different introductions, he did like uh, put different uh, emphasis on what is happening with uh, this socially necessary labor time. And he was specific to say that uh, uh, it involves everything from not just like labor, labor time, concrete labor, but specifically that it's, it involves circulation, money, uh, exchange. I don't know where you're going to get too embroiled, but actually... No, no, of course, of course. Because labor is involved in the process of exchange. People are moving things around, things are coming from one place to another. Yeah, yeah. These things all involve labor time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we are talking about value. Yeah, but, but the, the, the floating systematic relationship between socially necessary labor time and value, all I'm mm -hmm. saying is like, and we agree on this. No, no, definitely, definitely. Directly in the price, the level of differences between like commodities within lines. Anyway, because that will cause all kinds of problems in the performance. I I think that okay, this would be like really the last thing. I think that if you were right, then the socialist systems would be right. They would, I mean, well, yeah. they're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they, can't, they can't set a price in a rational way just on the basis of it. So yeah, that yeah. would be the difficulty. You know, it is funny sometimes. It's like I was reading a book by Nicholas Brown, uh -huh. and he's like, and he says something really weird. He says, um, <laughs> he says something like the, uh, like that, um, the, 
the, the Marxist theory of value, well, I don't know. I, I, okay, like the only reason there are all these differences in kinds of shoes that people wear, you know, it, it's because of capitalism, right? It's like these, these, you know, because it's detached from use value, right? That, and, and so, you know, obviously like a communist society would tend not because it's repressive and, you know, dehumanizing toward having only several kinds of shoes that are useful for different things. You know, and so then actually you could set prices in that way, but you can't explain the difference between Nikes and, you know, whatever, I don't know, uh, I can't think of another kind of shoe. Um, <laughs> Keds, you know, Keds on the basis of like, and that's because capitalism is this like, absurd system of generating these contingent differences between things on the, on the basis of desire. So I do think it's important then to think about how a commodity line, you know, in a communist system where you actually are generating, where you're producing things because people need them, that is to say on the basis of use value, and that's also how you're exchanging, there would be very few differences among products of labor within commodity lines, which is a very interesting thing. You know, and they would have more set prices, like as you see actually in socialist societies, there's like the car, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> like uh, everybody's got the Yugo and it costs the same, <laughs> you know? I mean, and that's cool, right? So that's, but these are facts um, um, I, I, I think we, I, I'm terribly sorry to, 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 do you have like final No, I have comments? a question for Ross. Uh, no, 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 the, I mean, what? You yeah. have a question for Ross? Yeah, because I was wondering... For, you mean for Nathan? No, 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 for Ross. I have a question because you have like this brilliant, brilliant idea how to encapsulate a whole lecture into an album cover. What would be my album cover? I think that's my question. Let me think about it. Thank you. <laughs> that's my first commission. Was <laughs> I thought there was like one small band again in your region, but okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, continue the debate uh, Thank you. later. Thank you. Uh, yeah.